Hey guys, this is the AC Service Tech, and today what we're going over are some of the differences between metering devices. So the two things that change the pressure in the HVACR system are the compressor and then the metering device. All right, so here we have three samples of metering devices. So these right here are thermostatic expansion valves, also referred to as TEV or TXV. Uh, the ones that have an adjuster on the bottom, you're able to adjust the spring pressure and you're typically going to find them in refrigeration. These two happen to come out of air conditioning systems and they uh, have non-adjustable springs in the bottom. So these are already set for a certain superheat. And um, basically what these do is they allow a certain amount of refrigerant through to the evaporator quill and that can change depending on the heat load across the evaporator quill. They're set to maintain a certain superheat so it will adjust you know, the refrigerant flow in order for efficiency and compressor safety. This right here is called a piston chamber or an orifice chamber. Inside of that chamber, you have a piston. All right, pistons will come in uh, different sizes depending on manufacturers, and some will have a Teflon seal on the front, and some will be uh, smaller in diameter, at least outside diameter. And then what you have is you have a fixed orifice hole and this will only allow a certain amount of volume of refrigerant through it. So when the refrigerant's coming into this, it's actually forced along the inside of this chamber, and so the refrigerant can no longer flow around the piston. All right, so, so this is referred to as a fixed orifice as well. This falls in the category of a fixed orifice, and this right here is a capillary tube. So this has a set inside diameter and also a set length by the manufacturer you may or may not see uh, a strainer on it it may look something like this you know instead of having a strainer on it it just comes right from the tube into the capillary tube and then it comes right back out the other side into another uh, line so this acts like a filter dryer basically and as well it has a screen to stop any contaminants in the inside from coming into the capillary tube. So uh, one of the things the capillary tube, it, it is a little bit more susceptible to getting clogged because it is such a small inside diameter and it's over a long length versus a piston, it's a short length and a, a larger hole. Uh, typically you find these on older air conditioning systems, there's still some out there, um, but they're typically used on window air conditioners or stand-up air conditioners or refrigerators, small mini fridges, RV units, you know, the top mount or the under mounts, they, they typically use the capillary tube just because it's, it's cheaper um, just to manufacture and to put into each of these package units. The thing is with these, they're not easily changed if you ever wanted to change the size, all right? So you have to actually unbraze it and, and all that and replace it. Well, during the brazing process of a capillary tube, it's easier to end up accidentally clogging the cap tube with braze, you know, if you spend too long brazing it or you put too much on, or uh, say you're soldering it, same thing. You want to make sure that you don't end up clogging the cap tube. Uh, but this does also does not have a bypass built into it for a heat pump. So you'd have to have an external bypass around the capillary tubing. The piston chamber allows a piston to actually have a bypass. When it's pushed forward in air conditioning mode, the only direction that the refrigerant can go is through the middle of the piston. All right, So it is getting metered then. But in heat mode, when the refrigerant changes directions, this piston actually slides forward and it doesn't seat, like up, up forward, it doesn't seal. And so what happens is the refrigerant can go around the piston or through the piston. And so that's called a non-active metering device in heat mode. So if you have a heat pump, you have two metering devices and you know in cooling mode or in heat mode, you have one active metering device out of the two metering devices that are installed on the system. So this allows a bypass. It also allows easy access in order to change a piston size, which is nice. Uh, it also allows for you to be able to install, like a piston chamber allows you to install a TXV on here instead of a piston. So if you take the piston out, you can use a TXV such as this one right here, and you can actually uh, have that get connected together and, and there you go. So then you have your, your TXV. And you still have your distributor tubes there connecting to the evaporator coil. So after the refrigerant turns from a high pressure, high temperature liquid refrigerant, hits the metering device, and then it goes into the distributor tubes, it then enters into the evaporator coil. 
So you see this one has happens to have six tubes, distributor tubes, and this one has two distributor tubes. So this was actually going to a smaller evaporator coil than this is. So even if you have a TXV, you're still going to need the distributor tubes to go over to the evaporator coil. These are a fairly cheap alternative to the TXVs, but the thing is with these, uh, these are not very good for, say, dry climates um, because you have to set the superheat a little higher, say, if you're off of the target superheat chart. Uh, but this is just a fixed orifice and it's not able to adjust uh, the refrigerant flow. So when you want the um, efficiency of the system to be the best, like when it's really, really hot, it's actually at its worst with a piston. Uh, and so what happens is you have a high superheat. Versus a TXV, a TXV can actually allow more refrigerant into the evaporator coil if there is a high heat load, such as a high temperature in the house or a high wet bulb in the house or, or in the building. So the TXV can actually add a considerable amount of efficiency. So it's able to, say, maintain a superheat of 10 to 14 degrees across the entire evaporator coil. It's able to adjust the refrigerant flow. And if you do happen to have a problem such as a blower motor being broken or a completely clogged filter dryer, the nice thing about a TXV is it will then close down, okay? So if it sees that you have low airflow because it has this sensing bulb here and this external equalization line, here it is on here. So here's the external equalization line. Here's the TXV bulb or the sensing bulb. It's actually able to close down the refrigerant flow to only have the, the smallest possible amount of refrigerant flow going into that evaporator quill. What that means is that you're not going to end up having liquid getting into the compressor. If you have too much liquid getting into the compressor, such as with a, with a piston, a fixed orifice, then you could have liquid slugging happening at the compressor. A uh, compressor is vapor only, and so if you have saturated state refrigerant or liquid refrigerant heading into the compressor, you're gonna end up damaging it. So the TXV is actually very helpful for, for protection for the compressor in a low airflow situation. The TXVs can have problems though, potentially if the bulb right here loses its refrigerant charge. Just so you know, from here on the head, the power head to the sensing bulb, you have refrigerant in there, all right? So you can picture this like as a little mini refrigerant bottle and you have this line going over to the head and when this is strapped onto the suction line with either copper or stainless steel straps, make sure that you don't tighten stainless steel straps too hard, uh, but you know, copper or stainless steel are fine. It won't have any uh, reaction, um, a corrosive reaction. But uh, what happens is as the sensing bulb heats up, it's going to apply more pressure onto the head. So what you have here is you actually have the external equalizer line and the spring pressure both pushing up on the pin, basically closing off the, uh, the flow of refrigerant. In the opposite direction, you have the, the bulb pressure and this is pushing down on the pin. So you have these two pressures pressing up and this pressure pressing down working in equilibrium in order to maintain, say, in this case, a 10 to 14 degree superheat across the evaporator coil. And if you want to help support any new videos coming out on this channel, I've got links down in the description below of a lot of the tools that I use. Any purchases made after clicking any of those links down in the description below, even if they're not purchases of those actual tools, ends up providing a commission to the channel. And if you want to support new videos being loaded to this channel, head on over to patreon.com slash Hope you enjoyed yourself, and we'll see you next time at AEC Service Tech Channel.